Quartermaster General East Front. Uh, Quartermaster General is a game system that I've enjoyed from the very beginning and I've been excited about pretty much every implementation that has come out in the last years. And this one is no exception. When I saw that there was a Quartermaster General about this topic, I was very happy and excited. Also, another interesting thing, this is a game for two players, so it is a more contained experience than uh, the other Quarter Master General games. I played it to two players against a human opponent, and I also played it two-handed, yes, controlling both sides to the best of my possibilities. It's The game is card-driven, but I play so many games two-handed that I had no problem doing that. With some practice, I believe there, uh, that other solo players may be able to do the same. The situation is the East Front. Now, so no surprises here. We have a group of Axis units, German and minor allies, ready to push towards Moscow, towards Leningrad, towards the Caucasus and Stalingrad. There are also some uh, units from Finland there, possibly ready to cross uh, over. And then we have a scattered number of Soviet units on the board, and things will be will be bad for our, for our Soviets. We have infantry, everything is represented by wooden pieces, so very nice, we have infantry, tanks, airplanes, and fleets. The Soviets all belong to a single faction, and the Germans have the two factions, or the Axis has two factions, the Germans and the and their allies, and they don't always, I can't, they don't always uh, coordinate well. Here we have the turn track, which represents the main events. Uh, during each turn, each player will take a turn. First the Germans go, then the Soviets go, and then we have another turn, another turn. The reminders of some game effects that are not in play. So, for example, you cannot sustain an attack uh, during winter, and you cannot advance in spring, probably because of mud. From time to time, you will score. Scoring is super simple. The number of stars uh, that you control on the board is how many points you score for that uh, scoring phase. You keep track of that. If at the end of a scoring phase, a player is 10 points or more ahead than the opponent, that player wins the game. Otherwise, you play until the end of the game, until the last round, and then the player with the highest score wins the game. Now you see that there is a space there, that's a reminder of the fact that you need to add some cards to your deck at that point, that is after winter 1941. As I said, this is a card-driven game, so you will use cards to, to perform effects. And uh, the first deck that you have is the mid deck. It starts from mid because I guess this is the middle of the war. And so these are the cards, for example, that the Axis has at the beginning of the game. You'll have your hand of cards and you'll play them. And when we reach that, that space of the scoring track, then you add these cards, you shuffle them together with the cards that are left from your mid deck. And the same thing happens so for the... Uh, for the Soviet Union. And uh, like it often, often happens in quartermaster generals, there is a games, there's a lot of stuff that is hardwired into uh, the composition of the decks of cards. So for example, the early cards for the uh, for the axis have a lot of extra actions. So a card will trigger another action, then another, and that really shows you the momentum of the initial invasion. And later on, they'll slow down as the Soviet player gets more attacks, more resources, and more powerful things later in the war. The turn structure. The active player first will get to move, and so you'll simply move uh, any and all of your units as you prefer. Infantry and tanks move only by one space at a time. Uh, airplane can move up to two. They can even fly over spaces that you don't control and where you're not in supply as long as you then land in a space that you control and is in supply. In this game, you can never voluntarily move out of supply like in other Quartermaster General games. Then you have the first action step, the second action step. So the active player will take two actions. I say at least two actions, two official actions, because again, many cards will trigger extra actions. 
Then you have the second movement step in which the active player can move fleet and tanks only. Now, when you win a combat, you don't by default have advance after combat. And so uh, the second step is a good uh, opportunity for your tanks to go in and take control of a territory they may have cleaned, cleared of enemy units. And there are also other game effects that may allow you to do so. So, first movement, two actions, second movement restricted to only some units, you check supply and you draw cards. You draw up to three cards or until you have five cards in hand, whichever comes first. The cards that you play to trigger actions, they will have an effect indicated there. If it is time for you to use that effect, that is usually the best thing, the best actions, the most efficient actions are the ones described here. Play a card, do what it says, if it applies to what you're trying to do. At the bottom, you have a, a band representing reactions, and they may have some restrictions about when or where you do them, and they usually interface with, with combat, and that's why. Very often the defender will play a card or will consider playing a card from hand to defend. There are also some reactions that you play as the attacker, but this band again applies to those secondary actions. You also have these contingency uh, plan cards. They are double-sided. They all start with the initial side face up. For one of your two actions, so you can choose to use one of these contingency plans, then you perform what it says here, and you flip it to the other side. If later for an action you decide to use that effect, uh, you do so, and then the card is out of the game. So each card can be uh, used up to twice per game, and you have different effects so that also represent the different uh, things that happen in different phases of the war. So, your two actions, you can, for your two actions, again, play a card and do what it says. That's your best option, usually. You can also choose to use conscription. You discard a card, ignoring what it says, to deploy an infantry, or two cards to deploy a tank, airplane, or fleet. And you need to then deploy it in a space in or adjacent to a supply flag, like so. Force March, discard a card to move a piece in case the initial movement wasn't good enough for your plans. Desperate Attack, discard two cards to attack a land space. Again, if I have a card that lets me attack with a single card, that is better. But what if I don't? Then go Desperate. Production Initiative, simply spend an action to draw a card. Contingency Plan, these cards that I showed you, also pass. Mm. Unlikely. <laughs> Both sides have so much to do. I still have to see that being an option that looks very desirable. Unless you're maybe stuck later in the game, you don't have cards left. So, our actions pretty much again is what you expect to move and attack and stuff like that. And I know you're all excited about combat, so let's talk about that. And I can tell you this is a game that really emphasizes the importance of combined arms. When you attack, either because a card explicitly lets you do so, or because you're discarding two cards for a desperate attack, you choose a force from a space and you declare an attack into an adjacent space. So from here, I'm declaring that I'm attacking there. That is when the opponent has a chance to play a card. For example, if you stand fast in a location that applies to the card, then you don't lose any uh, you don't lose your any units. If you exchange, you lose a unit, but so does the attacker. If you retreat, you can move away from uh, from the area. So these are some of the effects that you can expect that you can expect there. Suppose that the uh, Soviet player doesn't play any card, then the standard result of an attack, you declare an attack, is that the defender loses a game piece. Now, that was the first round of combat, then the attacker may choose, suppose that there were multiple pieces, may choose to continue the fight. Suppose that that was the situation, now we lost one, we lost an infantry, there is still one there. So the attacker, after the defender took a loss, can choose to attack again, 
To do so, you need to discard a piece yourself. So a single attack doesn't reduce your force as the attacker. Multiple rounds do. So each time you want to launch an attack, a round of attack after the first, you lose a piece. In this case, for example, I move this infantry and now I'm declaring another round of attack. The defender again may play a reaction. If that's not the case, they lose the unit. Why is our combined arms so important? Because the idea is to launch a subsequent round of attack is not enough to lose any piece. There is a hierarchy here, very laid out in the, in the player aid, of combat rank. If you want to launch a round of attack after the first, your rank of the piece that you lose to launch the attack must be equal to or higher than the piece that was just lost by the opponent. Suppose I'm launching my first round of attack, I eliminate this unit here. Uh, now the Germans to attack again, they can remove any unit. Infantry, they can remove another infantry. Suppose however that the uh, Soviets have removed this one to pay for the penalty of being attacked. Now to launch a second round of attack the Germans must lose an airplane or a fleet or play a sustain attack card. You can see that would be equal or higher. And when it comes to fleet and airplane, you can pay for things um, from adjacent spaces also, not necessarily only from the space in which you're launching the attack. So for example, I could use that one and remove it to pay or to match the loss of this one so I can launch another round of attack. It seems complicated, but after a couple of turns, it'll make perfect sense. First round of attack is you don't lose anything as the attacker, but depending on the rank of the piece that was removed, basically it'll become increasingly expensive to launch for the round of attacks. And here you also have reactions that will influence that. For example, you can ignore the fact that the if you play an anti-air card, uh, you can ignore the fact that the opponent removed air, an air unit. So it makes it easier and less expensive to launch later attacks. So this is the general idea of the game. You'll play cards either for their printed effect, either from hand or using contingency cards, or you'll discard cards to uh, get extra units, extra movement, uh, launch extra attacks. And as the Germans, you're trying to take control of as many victory spaces as possible, as quick as possible, gain a big lead, which you will need because at some point the Soviets will start pushing back. And as a Soviet, you're trying, of course, to um, bide your time, delay the invasion as much as possible, slow it down really as much as possible, uh, rearm, build forces in here, and then go and and smash them and try to push them back all the way to Berlin, if you can. What I always liked about the Quartermaster General system is the elegance and simplicity and the gargantuan amount of crown that they managed to pack in a deck of cards in just such simple rules but everything that historically happened could have happened makes sense uh, that it would have happened it's hardwired right in there and here you have that from the momentum of the initial momentum of Barbarossa being captured by the initial deck being later diluted uh, by the uh, by the addition of those other cards to the Axis deck and again, the rearmament and the, uh, the, the response of the Soviet being constructed in the same way by the two different decks. And then just the cards, again, feel incredibly thematic. And knowing those cards can be very important when you realize that one size of flamethrowers can, that can destroy all infantry in one space, then you really don't want to have those like giant, as the Soviet, those giant uh, human waves. That, in any case, don't do that much. Actually, it may take a while for the opponent to to reduce them until they take control. But as the attack, but as an attacking force, they're not particularly powerful because, uh, well, because again, if the uh, enemy, uh, if you're attacking with the human waves on the infantry and the enemy removes a tank, a single tank, then you cannot launch a further attack because you cannot pay uh, with a loss that is equal rank or higher. 
Test system is very simple. Again, it's very intuitive and it's so much in the spirit of, of Quartermaster General because, well, you have large numbers as the Soviets are able to master, which are good for defense, but they're not as effective in attack. And the Germans have combined arms from the very beginning. However, the, the Axis play, I should say, also has to struggle with the, with the effects applying only to one faction or another, unless there's a card that lets you break that rule, of course. So coordinating these things is, is a little more challenging. So both sides have interesting challenges there. And again, what is almost preternatural is how much history is conveyed, is distilled in such a simple system. When I was playing two-handed solo, well, guess what? This time, at that time, I tried to uh, drive toward Moscow and the Germans looked like they were gonna just steamroll over Moscow. There was no way of stopping them, but because of card play, the Soviets stopped them in winter 41, right in front of the gate of Moscow. I'm like, that's perfect, that's amazing. I was playing both sides to the best of my possibilities and the history enacted itself through the components and the mechanics of the game. The components look great, the, the map is great, it's both nice looking and functional, those wooden pieces, very nice. And again, the, the rule book does a really good job of explaining the new mechanics and the new ideas. These reactions really uh, add to the flavor and to the chrome. So what you have here is an intensely historical experience distilled through very minimalistic mechanics, through incredibly well-designed um, decks of cards, resulting in a really rewarding, fun gameplay experience, and one that you can play in an evening very, very easily. And again, if you don't mind playing card-driven games uh, solo, which I don't mind, uh, it can even be played two players, uh, two-handed, but again, most likely, most normal human beings, such as yourself, who want to play two players, and that's fine, because again, it of course, it's an excellent two-player game. Generally speaking, I'm very happy. I'm very, very, very happy with Quartermaster General East Front.